ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار وبعد All praises due to Allah. We laud him, we praise him, in him we beseech and seek assistance and help, and in him we seek forgiveness. And we seek the refuge with Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, from the mischiefness of our souls and the wrong results and actions of our deeds. Whoever Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, Guys, no one can lead him astray, and whoever Allah, the sublime and the mighty, leads to be left astray, no one will be able to guide them. And I publicly, without any coercion, without any force or compulsion, bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad, who died 1,400. And 16 years ago, in the desert of Arabia, is his messenger, his final messenger, the seal of all prophets, and the seal of all the revelations that Allah sent to all the prophets before him. <clears throat> As to what follows, the best speech is the book of Allah, and the best guidance is the guidance of that man named Muhammad, of whom we should all be wanting to know about. And the worst of all things in this life. Our novelties or newly invented issues into our religion. For every newly invented issue in our religion is an accursed and wretched innovation, and every single innovation is a going astray, and every going astray is in the hellfire. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. <clears throat> After thanking Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, um, I then thank you for inviting me here to Camden, New Jersey. To speak uh, on the subject of which, unfortunately, I myself wasn't clear in uh, the uh, the actual intent of the subject until I just asked the brother just a couple of minutes ago, and I asked him, "Is it okay if I、um, change the subject a little bit?" Uh, because the subject is,、um, "Why do we take shahada, and what is the meaning of the shahada?" And I asked the brother, "Can I change the the meaning of it to why why should you be a Muslim? Why should you be a Muslim?" Um, but unfortunately, from what I see in front of me, it seems as though、um, these words may be wasted because it seems as though the majority of the people here are already Muslim.、Um, but for those of you who are non-Muslim, whatever religion you may be. Or whatever religion that you used to be and you don't ascribe to anymore, then I'd like to appeal to you、uh, on this subject: Why should you be a Muslim? And、uh, firstly, before we、uh, begin and try our best not to bore you, I'd like to say that I think I'm qualified, and I'm not qualified to talk about a whole lot of subjects. I can only maybe think of maybe one or two subjects that I think I'm qualified to talk about, and this may be one of them. One of the reasons why I think I'm qualified to talk about why you should be a Muslim is because at one time in my life I wasn't a Muslim. So I think 
after living both lives, I think I have some qualification on why a person, whether they're black, whether they're white, no matter what color their skin may be, no matter what texture of hair they may have, no matter what language they may speak, I think I'm qualified to say on this subject, why should you be a Muslim? First of all, I'd like to um, mention some things that maybe people think is Islam. We're going to try to dispel some of the misnomers, the misnomers and the misconceptions that we have here in the society, this American society, on what is Islam by mentioning what isn't Islam. And it's interesting for those of you who are non-Muslims, and maybe some of the Muslims here may not even know it, that the most misunderstood religion in the world, and at the same time the most despised and rejected religion in the world, is Islam, for those of you who don't know. At the same time, this misunderstood way of life and this despised and rejected and held in contempt religion called Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. And this is not the words of me. This is the words of non-Muslims. Non-Muslims. They have statistics that they are claiming that are accurate, and we believe that they're more accurate than what they say, that Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world, and it's the fastest growing religion in the United States. In fact, <clears throat> to make a note of why it's despised, or one of the points of uh, statements the why it's despised, about four or five years ago, maybe longer than that, uh, President, the former President Nixon, mentioned on national TV, on national TV, not in some park somewhere or in his blue room or green room when he was in the White House, but he said this on national television, that now that we've done or we're about to do away with communism, now we have to concentrate on the biggest threat that we have to this nation. And that's not the drugs, that's not prostitution, that's not inflation. That's not maternal mortality rate. It's land. It's on national TV, documented, that the biggest threat to this society, according to the former President Nixon, is Islam. And according to Dan Rather and Mike Wallace, just two years ago, on 60 Minutes, the fastest growing religion in the United States is Islam without any advertising, without any national television shows, without any national radio programs, without any billboards like the Christians and the Jews and the other religions have, without any major, major advertising in any of the newspapers, Islam is the fastest growing religion in the United States and in the world, they added to this. And Mike Wallace said, <coughs> that by the year 2300, they estimate that one out of every three people in the entire country is going to be a Muslim. Already, one out of every four people are Muslim. Four billion people in the world. One billion people are Muslim. Four billion people, one billion are Muslim. By the year 2300, according to a non-Muslim, one out of every three people in this country is going to be a Muslim. Now, for the Muslim, we already knew this. We already knew that Islam was going to grow like this. In addition to this, out of all the prison systems in the United States, federal prisons, state prisons, county prisons, local or city prisons and city jails, the fastest growing religion in the prison system in the United States right now is the religion of Islam. In the armed forces, the fastest growing religion in the Navy, in the Marines, even in the Coast Guard, the Army, in the Air Force, documented by the non-Muslims is Islam. What is the reason? Why are so many people becoming Muslims? Why that when just two years ago, 
or around that time when this Gulf War broke out? Why did over 8,000 members of the, of the uh, American troops, why did over 8,000 members of the American troops while they were stationed in Saudi Arabia accept Islam and become Muslim? 35% of them were white, 16% of them were women. And they also have some statistics that Islam is the fastest growing religion among women today. More women are accepting Islam now than any other religion in the United States. Why is this happening? Why are people becoming Muslim? Why are people accepting Islam? There's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons, as when a Protestant chaplain, a Reverend Bogosian, one day when we were driving to work, I used to work as a chaplain, quote unquote, in New York State Corrections, and we used to carpool. And I had an office with the Jewish chaplain and the Catholic chaplain and the Protestant chaplain. The Protestant chaplain one day, Reverend Bogosian, he asked me, he said, Daoud, why did you leave Christianity? Because he also knew that I was in the Christian ministry. I used to be in the Christian ministry in the Christian church, in the Pentecostal church. I was on my way to go to the seminary to become a minister. He said, why did you leave Christianity and accept this land? And I told him, I said, there were at least two or three reasons. But the main reason was, it wasn't because of the oppression of black people and the white people had their foot on the black people's necks and all those other reasons that people always give for accepting Islam or some other silly reasons or not so silly reasons. I told him there was basically two or three reasons. And one of the reasons was that I just had this problem of understanding the Trinity and accepting the Trinity as a philosophy, for lack of a better word, or a concept that made sense. I told him as we were driving, we were riding, he was riding my car, I said, it doesn't seem right for me as a creature of the creator of the heavens and the earth to worship, even though I was pushing this in the church, to worship a creator who's going to make something as a religious way of life have some confusion in it. It just didn't seem right that the creator of the heavens and earth would have some ambiguity or some vagary, some confusion or cloudiness around the basic principles of that religion. And I said one of those basic principles was the Trinity. I just couldn't understand why the basic principles of Christianity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, there wasn't one verse in the Bible that substantiated it. And I was a student. I wasn't just a layman on the street. I was a student, and he knew because he, was a, he had a doctor of divinity, so he knew better than I did, that there wasn't one verse in this Bible, 66 books in the Protestant version, 73 books in the Catholic version, no matter what Bible you read, Wycliffe, Schofield, Lane, New World Translation, the Mormon Bible, the Seventh-day Adventist Bible, didn't make any difference. Not one verse that was of the original manuscript that proved that God was three. Not one. That was an original part of the text of the Bible. And so he looked over to me. He's a much older man than me. He said, you know, one of our female ministers, she gave a very beautiful explanation on this. And this, his answer on the, the explanation of the Trinity was one of the reasons why I can sit and tell you why you should be a Muslim. He said to me, she explained this thing very beautifully. She said that Christian, the concept of the Trinitarian doctrine is like an egg. You see, Daoud, the egg has three parts. It has the shell, it has the yolk, and it has the white. And all of that makes up the egg. He said, isn't that beautiful? I said, yes, that's very beautiful, and especially because I like eggs. I said, but that theory, that theory doesn't hold water, Reverend Bogosian. He said, why? I said, because you know just like I know. And by this time, we're riding through the beautiful mountains upstate New York. I'm trying to look at the road and look at him at the same time. I said, you know as well as I do, Reverend Bogosian, that there's no verse in the Bible that can substantiate this. And number two, that the basic doctrine of Christianity 
is that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are all equal. They're all equal, and they all coexist at the same time. When one is there, the other two are there also. And when the second one is there, the third and the first one is there also. And when the second is there, the third is there, the first is there, when the first is there, the third and the second is there, etc. Not only do they coexist or do are they co-equal, but if one were to leave, quote unquote, then the other two have to leave also because of their coexistence and their co-eternality. I said, secondly, if you were to take that white from that egg, you don't have an egg anymore because all you have left is the shell and the yolk. You don't have a complete egg. And if you take away the shell, you just have the yolk and the white. And if you take away the yolk, you just have the white and the shell. That egg is not complete. So if you're saying to me, Reverend Bogosian, that when the father sends the son, and the son supposedly was crucified, and he died on the cross, you're telling me, Reverend Bogosian, that the father and the Holy Ghost also died. And if you're not telling me that, then they're not co-equal and they don't coexist. And you know, brothers and sisters in Islam and dear guests, Reverend Bogosian had another answer. He replied to me. He said, Daoud, we just have to believe in it. We just have to believe in it. And I told him, I said, yes. And this is the thing that I fought with up until my 14th birthday in the junior ministry in the church. That here I am pushing this concept that I learned from my dear mother and that she learned from her dear mother and that she learned from her dear mother. And when I asked my mother, Exactly what Allah says in the Quran. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمُ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ قَالُوا بَلْ نَتَّبِعُوا مَا أَلْقَيْنَا عَلَيْنِ آبَاءَنَا Why, when the, you are said to, when it is said to them, why don't you follow that which was revealed from your Lord? They say to you, they will say, we follow what our fathers follow. When they're asked, why don't you follow that which was revealed? Not what some man added to it, but why don't you follow? Why don't you accept? Why don't you adhere to that which the Creator revealed? They say, no, we follow that which our fathers followed. And this is what I, when I asked my mother. I said, Mom, why do you believe Jesus is the Son of God after showing her all the proof? She said, because that's what my father and my mother taught me. You see, the reason why a person becomes a Muslim are various reasons. Some people accept Islam because they think that this is a religion of black people. Until they find out that there are millions of white Muslims all throughout the world. Millions of white Muslims. Some people accept Islam because they view Islam like a gang. And they want protection, especially some brothers who are locked up. They accept Islam in the prison system. They think Islam is like some hard rock crew, so they accept Islam so they don't get pounced on. Some people accept Islam because they believe that this way of life takes you out of being oppressed. Some people accept Islam because they want to get married to a Muslim. And they know that if they're going to get that man or get that woman, they have to be a Muslim, which is not true. Now we'd like to discuss why should you be a Muslim? Number one, this word Muslim is an active participle grammatically. It means one who submits themselves to the will of the creator of the heavens and the earth. And I keep pointing up for a reason that we'll come to, inshallah. If it's the will of Allah, the Creator, will come to the reason why I keep pointing up when I'm addressing him. A Muslim is one who submits to the will lovingly, lovingly, willfully, intentionally, without any compulsion. They submit their entire self to the will of the Creator of the heavens and the earth, Allah. And this word, Muslim, denotes 
that that person now has become a slave. So when a person invites a non-Muslim, like some of you, to Islam, he or she is actually inviting you not to just become a Muslim, they're, they're inviting you to become a slave. But a slave to whom? A slave to the creator of the heavens and the earth. If you look at all the other religions, and there are many, many religions in the world. There's Taoism, there's Confucianism, there's Jainism, there's Christianity with so many hundreds, maybe thousands of denominations. There's Judaism with a couple of hundred or few denominations. When you look at the name of the individual, when you look at the name of the individual or the name of their religion, every single one has its origin either in a place, like a town or a village, or some event that happened in history, or it's named after some person. The only religion in the world that the person who practices that religion is connected to the creator of the heavens and the earth is Islam. Islam meaning to submit yourself to the will of Allah. But the title Christian, the title Jew, the title Hindu, the title Buddhist is connected to some human being. The origin of that word is connected to some human being. That Allah himself created that human being. Or it's connected to some town or some place, some village or some tribe or something like this. Christians call themselves Christians because Jesus is the Christ. And Muslims believe that Jesus is the Christ. We believe this. And some people don't know that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, born of the Immaculate Conception, and that he was sinless. Jews, they have this name because of Judah, because of a tribe. Hindus have the word Hindu, their name, because of that affiliation. And Buddhists, because of Buddha. And we can go on and on, Confucianism, etc. But Muslims and Islam have their name and title of their religion because they're connected to the one who they submit to, who is Allah. They submit to the will of the Creator and they make themselves slaves to the one who created Jesus, the one who created Moses, the one who created Abraham and Muhammad and the rest of them, and everything that you can see and you can't see. So why should you be a Muslim? You should be a Muslim it's because the creator of the heavens and the earth says in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I did not create the jinn, which is a certain kind of creature that he created that we can't see, or the human being, except for one reason, the creator says, except to worship me. Islam is the only religion, the Muslims are the only people that realize that the reason why they were created is not to win the playoffs, these games, these basketball games, not to be a basketball player. Allah didn't create us to be nuclear physicists. Allah didn't create us to be carpenters. Allah didn't create us to be plumbers or beauticians or sanitation workers or taxi cab drivers. Allah didn't create the human being to waste his time using drugs or selling their bodies on the street. Allah didn't create the human being to, to worship things that he created. I'll say that again. Allah didn't create the human being to worship something that he created. He created the human being to worship him who created him. This by itself, dear listeners, is the reason why you should be a Muslim. When you become a Muslim, you are returning to the reason why you created. If you were to ask the average person, dear non-Muslim listeners, ask yourself right now, those of you who are non-Muslim, why was I created? Just think about it. I'll stop for a minute. Think about the reason that you would probably give if I asked you this question one-on-one. -on -one. Why were you created, Sally, or Harry, or Leroy, or whatever your name may be? Why were you created? I guarantee you, you're going to come up with some reason that's connected to this life and it's not going to help you in the next life. I guarantee you. Whatever the reason you think you're created, it's going to stop at the grave. It's not going to help you in the next life. Oh, I was created to be a good person. I was created to help my fellow man. I was created 
to be a scientist, whatever. But the reason why you were created is so that you can worship your Lord. And worshiping your Lord is something that you don't have the choice of doing. You see, it would be unimaginable, non-Muslim listeners, it would be unimaginable for an employer to employ you and let you work in his business and run that business any way you want. Who that has a good business sense and their right mind is going to allow you to work in their business, you get hired from McDonald's, and they're going to allow you to represent, wear the cap and the uniform of Burger King? This is unthinkable. The creator of the heavens and the earth is going to create you. He's going to create me and every human being that he created. And he's going to leave you to worship him the way you want to worship him? It doesn't make sense. So the detailed program of how we are to submit to him and worship him is called Islam. Because every single way of life or religion leaves that person to pick and choose how they want to worship the creator. Even though they have a book, the Jews have a Talmud and the, the so-called Torah, the Christians have the Bible, the Hindus have their book. But if you look inside these scriptures, or those things that they call the scriptures, you'll find that they are statements of human beings, and you'll find their statements of not just human beings, you'll find that they're statements that will lead a person to destruction in this life and the next. That goes against the very nature of the human being. For instance, for instance, if you're smacked on the cheek, then turn the other cheek. This goes against the very nature of animals, let alone a human being. The very nature of an animal is that if you strike it, it's going to either defend itself by spraying some spray like a skunk or the porcupines it will shoot out, those spikes will shoot out, those things will shoot out at you. Or if it's a lion, you're really in bad shape or a pit bull or something like this. The human being is created that if you smack him, the natural reaction is, is to defend himself. Now here's something that we're saying is from the creator of the heavens and the earth. Somebody breaks in your house. Somebody rapes, may Allah forbid, your wife. And you turn the other cheek and say, no, here, take all, you took my television, here's my refrigerator, here's my washing machine, and if you want my wife again, may Allah forbid, you can have her again. Islam shows the human being exactly how they're to live their lives. Have you ever heard of a religion that for every single act, there's a prayer? I've never, and I'm not boasting, I'm not here to boast. But I've read a lot about a lot of different religions in detail, in detail. Probably some religions that some of you have never even heard of, like the religion of the people in Australia, the Aborigines in the jungles of Australia, who worship a god called Atnatu. Have you ever heard of a religion, a way of life that has a prayer for every single act? A prayer that keeps you remindful of the, keeps you mindful of the Creator. Always calling on the Creator. For the Muslim, he has a prayer for putting on his clothes. She has a prayer for taking off her clothes. We have a prayer when we look in the mirror. We have a prayer when we go to the bathroom. We have a prayer when we come out of the bathroom. We have a prayer when we get in a car, in a boat, in a plane. We have a prayer when we put on our shoes. We have a prayer when we get on a horse. We have a prayer when we get a new job. We have a prayer when we go to the shopping mall. There's a prayer that you say before you go into the shopping mall. There's a prayer even when the Muslim is getting ready to have sexual intercourse with their legal, their legal wife or husband. There's a prayer. There's a prayer when the baby comes out the mother's womb. There's a prayer for everything. So the person who's a Muslim, who becomes a Muslim, why should you be a Muslim? Just for this one aspect alone, they're constantly, constantly, constantly calling on their Lord. Constantly, 24-7. 24 hours a day, seven days a week before you go to bed, when you get in the bed, 
you wipe the bed off, you say a prayer for that. When you wake up, there's another prayer. When you wash up, there's another prayer. And this may seem like this is very, very restrictive, or this may seem like extremism, but what type of religion is going to connect you to the Creator like that? What kind of religion does this? And at the same time, you can be a police officer. At the same time, you can be a fireman. At the same time, you can still be a beautician. But you're never disconnected with your Lord. You don't go to the mosque on one day and then all the other six days you do something else. You don't go to the church on one day and all the other days you do something else. The Creator is always connected to you, figuratively speaking, because of the way that the religion of Islam is set up. The way it's set up. The political system, the social system, the economic system is set up in a way that you are always constantly worshiping your Lord. But the real benefit of becoming a Muslim, and this may shock some of the people who are non-Muslims here, and I have to say it. I have to say it. And those of you who know me from the past, you know I say some things that are kind of controversial. I have to say that by you come becoming a Muslim, you will receive salvation. Now all the other religions say this also. Accept Christianity, accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, believe in the vicarious blood atonement, believe that he died for your sins, and he rose on the third day from the sepulcher, you will have salvation. Or whatever other religion. So Islam, y'all, you, you Muslims are no different. Or you Muslims are no different. No, but we're telling you that you, if you become a Muslim, you will receive salvation. Why? For two basic reasons. The first reason is, is that would you like to gamble with your soul? Do you actually believe that the Creator put you on this earth and that you won't stand in front of Him and answer to Him for what you did? Whether you live 20 years, 40 years, 60 years, you're going to have to stand in front of Him. Now, would you rather stand in front of something that He created knowing that you did the good things of this life that he commanded you? Or would you like to stand in front of him? Do you think, do you think that you will be left alone just saying that you won't believe and you, that you believe and you won't be tested and that you won't have to stand in front of him? If this is true in your chest, that you believe that you're going to stand in front of the creator of the heavens and earth, and that maybe, may Allah forbid, the ceiling may fall on us and we may all die, do you feel safe that you live the life that he, the creator of the heavens and the earth, told you to live? Do you feel safe that you'll be able to get away with doing whatever you did and saying that someone else died for my sin? Do you actually believe that? If you feel safe that someone else who didn't commit the sin, but you drank all the Johnny Walker Red, and you smoked all the reefer, and you committed all the fornication, and things worse than that, and there are things worse than that, do you actually think, or you believe, or would you like to gamble with your soul, that you can safely say that you'll stand in front of the Creator of the heavens and the earth, that you'll stand in front of the Creator of the heavens and the earth, and be able to say to Him, I worshiped you in the way that I felt best, Please forgive me and grant me your paradise. And he'll grant you his paradise based on your good intentions. I like to tell you that the answer is you're wrong. You're wrong. Because Allah, the Most High, has explained to us in the Quran, وَمَن يبتغي غير الإسلام دينا فلن يقبل منه وهو في الآخرة من الخاسرين Whoever seeks a religion other than Islam, it will never be accepted from him. And in the last day, he'll be the losers. The second reason, the second reason is that each and every human being, every human being that Allah created, every single human being that Allah created, they have what we call a time span. Everything has a time span on this planet. Everything. 
the flies, the mosquitoes, the flowers, the birds, whatever. And you and I have a time span also. And we don't know when we're going to die. And within that time span, there are some things that we have to do. In order for us to find out what we have to do, we have to go back to the creator of the heavens and earth to find out what is that thing that we have to do. Now I'd like to ask the question. This is a rhetorical question that we won't, that we won't, inshallah, that we won't, inshallah, tax you with. I'd like to ask a question that I don't want you to answer if you're non-Muslim. I'd like for you to answer it in your mind. How many of you in your mind, and you raise the hand in your mind, how many of you thought that Islam was this stuff that you hear Louis Farrakhan talking about? How many of you thought that Islam was this stuff that the five percenters are talking about? How many of you thought that Islam was what the Moorish American Science Temple, I don't know if they had that down here, but the Moorish American Science Temple, Noble Raleigh's people, was Islam? How many of you thought that that stuff that you see in Iran that Khomeini used to be about was Islam? Probably some of you would say, yes, in my mind, you would raise your hand in your mind, you would say, oh yeah, I just thought Farrakhan's group was another sect of Muslims. Well, I'm here to tell you, we're here to tell you today that this is an Islam. That Islam is not wearing a bow tie and selling bean pies. That Islam is not having your wife walk behind you five or ten paces. That Islam is not Saddam Hussein or Muammar Gaddafi. That Islam is not blowing up the World Trade Center. That Islam is not any of those things that people, out of their ignorance or intentionally, try to make Islam seem it is. Islam is the natural way of life that every single human being has to accept and follow. And if they follow Islam, if they accept Islam, if you become a Muslim, then you will receive salvation. You will receive the most greatest of rewards which is to see the face of your Lord, Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, the glorified and exalted, is to receive the greatest of rewards, to drink drinks that you never thought existed, to eat fruits that you never knew existed, to never ever grow old, to never have diseases, that when you sweat in paradise, the perspiration smells like perfume. And you get better and better and better. And yes, for those of you who are thinking about being married and things like this, yes, there's marriage in paradise. And not only is there marriage, but well, we won't get into that. I won't, I won't get into that. But there's so many things that we can mention for you to benefit. Not just the next life, but in this life, Islam brings order to your life. Because I'm going to tell you, and you may not like it, those of you who are non-Muslim, and I'm not saying this to ridicule you, to diss you. I'm telling you because it's the truth, because I'm a, I was a Muslim, I was a non-Muslim. Islam brings order to your life. And if you're not a Muslim, your life has confusion. Now, what's my proof? What's my proof? How is this guy going to come all the way from North New Jersey or come down the hill and tell us we're confused? Who do you think he is? I'm telling you, if you're not a Muslim, you've got confusion in your life. What's my proof? My proof is, is that if you're not connected to the creator of the heavens and the earth, and you are worshiping him the way he ordered you to worship him, if you're not worshiping him the way he ordered you to worship him, and worshiping him alone, without going to some intermediary, or some intercessor, calling on some human being or some rock or some stone. And I don't think anybody here is going to be worshiping any stone or no rock or no trees. But some of us are doing even worse than that. We're worshiping human beings. If you are not calling on him and worshiping him in a manner that is befitting him, in the manner that he himself says to worship him, then you have to have confusion in your life. How can you say you don't have confusion in your life even if you're the CEO of IBM if you believe in three gods? How can you say you don't have confusion? If there was two gods or more, it has to be confusion in the universe. How much more a person that worships three gods? Just 
think about it. You got a God over here that says, I want to, I'm going to make a snow today. You have a God over here that says, no, I'm going to make it rain today. Which one is going to make it rain and which one is going to make it snow? There's going to be confusion. If you don't worship the creator of the heavens and earth by himself, alone by himself, there's no way you're going to tell me that you don't have confusion. Number one, you eat whatever you want to eat. You didn't even find out about the creator who created you and gave you this food before you were born. All these fruits and vegetables, all these fish and animals were already here before you came out of your mother's womb. And now you have the audacity. Now that you're not crawling anymore and drinking from your mother's breast milk, you have the audacity now that you become strong and adult-like to wear what you want to wear and eat what you want to eat and sleep with whoever you want to sleep with and you say this is not confusion? How can you, get, how can you say this is not confusion? How can you say this is not disorder? But for the Muslim, the Muslim obeys the Creator in everything. We wear what he says we should wear. We eat what he says we should eat. We sleep with whom he says we should sleep with. There's order in the Muslim's life. In every single thing that we do. Look at the social system of Islam. And look at the social system of the United States of America. In the social system of the United States of America, and I don't have to tell you about it, you already know about it. Let's take the, social, the, social, the, the welfare system. You know and I know, even though you're getting some benefit, a few crumbs from it, and I'm saying a few crumbs, this system stinks. It stinks, and you know it. And that's why there's so many social welfare reform programs. Look at the social system of Islam. And this social system can be used in any place, any time. If you took the social system, the social welfare system of the United States, it won't work in England, and it won't work in Australia, and it'll never work in Denmark or Finland. It only works in the United States. But the social system of Islam works anywhere in the world, at any time, any place. The Muslims are commanded to give 2.5% of their money at the end of the year to the poor. You see, in Islam, the money circulates like this. In the Western system, the money goes from the, from the bottom upward. It goes from the poor to the rich in an upward motion. And anyone who studies economics, you know this is a fact. In the Western world, the social economic system, the money goes from the poor always to the rich. And, the, and for the trickle-down theory, it just comes a little bit back down to the poor. But in Islam, the social system has it that everybody gets a piece and the person is commanded, commanded when they have wealth to give to the poor. And if they don't give to the poor, not like in America, I don't have to give my money. I could be banked up $50 million in the bank. And nobody's going to force me to, to take care of these poor people. I don't have to give them a dime. But in Islam, when the Muslim mayor or governor sends that authority out to your house at the end of the year, you're going to give that money up to the poor. Or what happens? It may sound barbaric, you're going to be jailed. Because the poor have to be taken care of. They have to be taken care of. Look at the political system in Islam. In this system, democracy is the way. And we know, as they claim, we know as they claim, that this system is for the people and by the people. And the people, to use the common term, can push up, they think, they think, can push up on the president and change things. Or push up on the senator or the congressman and change things. But how does that person come into office? And what is the moral character of that person? For instance, the politician, he may give you something on this side of the table, but the same person that you helped get that politician into office, he's also helping the homosexuals over here. See, it's like a double-edged sword. In Islam, the politician, not only does he or she have to be moral, but that person also has to use the law of Allah. They can't use something from Aristotle. They can't use the Magna Carta. They can't use the Constitution of the United States that was put together and we all know that's an association of boy love, NAMLA, or whatever it is, where you can actually buy a magazine here in the United States and you can buy children as young as 18 months old up to 14 years of age where you can actually buy or rent a child that has sexual intercourse with them. 
And some of the people who are making legislation in this country are members of that organization. Islam is a perfect way of life. In every single facet of that life, Allah is always first. So this is another reason why we should be Muslims. Because, because it connects us with the creator of the heavens and the earth, and it brings order to our lives. Now I don't want to belabor this talk. I don't want to bore anybody any more than I've already bored them. But I'd like to tell you one more thing on why you should become a Muslim. Which is the opposite of the first thing I mentioned. If you don't accept this land, if you don't believe and accept and bear witness that there's nothing worthy of worship as a deity except Allah. Allah is not a man. He's not black, he's not white, he's not a spirit. He's not a man. Allah is the creator of men. Allah is the creator of black. Allah is the creator of white. Allah is the creator of spirit. He's the creator of everything. If you don't accept the religion of Islam and don't bear witness that there's nothing worthy of worship, Jesus, Moses, Muhammad are out of the picture. Only one creator is worthy of worship with no partner. If you don't accept this before you die, then you will have a chastisement that is unlike any chastisement that you've ever, that you, you can't even imagine. Unlike anything that you can imagine. And I am, I am compelled to tell you this. Now, once again, that's what the Christians say. If you don't accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, then you're going to burn in hell. So I'm here to tell you that there's a big difference. The difference is, dear listeners, is that if this was true, if this is true, that we have to believe that there's someone else that's going to die for our sins, if there's someone else that died for the sins of all human beings, for sins that he himself didn't even commit, if this is the case, then we are going to be doomed before we even go to the next life. And why is that? For one simple reason. No soul shall bear the burden of another. No soul shall bear the burden of another. And in your Bible, it says, the iniquities of the father will not be on the, the sin of the father will not be on the son, and the iniquities of the son will not be on the father. As a man sows, so shall he reap. This is what it says in the Bible. So how could it be that Adam committed a sin, someone thousands of years after him who didn't commit the sin, thousands of years after him, is going to die for the sins of Adam, not only Adam, and because of Adam, every human being has a black spot on their heart, and they're sinners by birth. Now some other human being that had nothing to do with this whatsoever is going to come and die for the people who committed sin? It doesn't make sense. So we're telling you that your salvation in this life and your salvation in the next life is that you have to worship the creator of the heavens and the earth by himself. You can't put any partners with him. You have to worship him alone. If you do this, you will receive the paradise that he has promised. And if you don't do this, you will receive an abasing, abasing chastisement and that chastisement will last for an eternity. It won't be for a few days. It won't be for a few weeks or a few months or a few years. That punishment will last forever. Now, I'd like to ask you once again, how many of you who are non-Muslims, don't raise your hand, the hand in your mind and your heart, how many of you really think that you have it made and you like to gamble your soul? Put your soul on the table as the stake. These are the stakes. If you don't like in Las Vegas, put all your chips up there. This is my soul. I'm absolutely sure that I have to have someone else to go between me and the Creator in order to receive my salvation and I'm ready to die on that. How many of you are absolutely sure? If you think about it, I don't think you are. How many of you are absolutely sure that you are doing exactly what He wants you to do? 
And how many of you are absolutely sure that you're not going to walk out of this room and don't get hit by a car? Or don't get hit by a stray bullet? Or some face that somebody's trying to lift up to the roof or some room falls on your head? Or whatever, heart attack. Are you absolutely sure? Do you know when you're going to die? So we're asking you, for those of you who thought that Islam was that black stuff that Farrakhan is talking about, and for those of you who thought that Islam was whatever people think is Islam, other than what we said today, for those of you who now know what is Islam and why you should be a Muslim, we'd like to ask you, not in front of everybody, we'd like to ask you to accept this way of life that the Creator has ordered you, has prepared for you to live, and that you come into the fold of Islam and become a Muslim. Become a Muslim like so many of the people, like Mike Wallace said on 60 Minutes, are doing today in America. And I'd like to tell you something in my final word, that the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, who was the one who the book that Allah sent, the last revelation, after the, the book of Moses and the books of Jesus and the books of Abraham and David and all the other prophets, the Qur'an, after he sent those books, he sent the Qur'an as the final revelation. This Prophet Muhammad, who is the best example for all human beings, he told us that Islam is going to spread as far as night and day and there's not going to be a house that Allah is going to leave except Islam is going to go into that house. So you won't be able to get away from it. There's going to come a time, grandmothers listening to my voice, mothers, fathers that are listening to my voice, there's going to come a time, it's going to be inevitable. If you don't accept Islam, somebody in your family is going to accept Islam. Your children, your grandchildren, your nieces, your uncles, your aunts, somebody in your family is going to accept Islam. And you're going to be hearing, if it will, if it's the will of Allah, the same message may be better than what you heard today. You're not going to be able to get away from this Islam. It's going to go into every single house, whether it's a desert house or a city house. So we're asking you to come back to the natural way of life to come back to the way that you were created is to submit yourself willfully, lovingly, without any compulsion to the will of the creator of the heavens and the earth who is above the heavens. He's not everywhere, he's not in this water, he's not in this microphone, he's not in my heart, he's not in your heart. We don't carry the, the creator of the heavens and the earth around with us. He's above the heavens that he created in a manner that is befitting his majesty. We ask you to accept this way of life the way of life of Moses, the way of life of Jesus, the way of life of Abraham, all the prophets of Islam. This is what we ask you today. And these and other reasons that we haven't mentioned are the reasons why you should be a Muslim. And don't delay it saying, oh, well, you know, I got a little time, you know, I'm thinking about becoming a Muslim, but, you know, I just can't stop smoking cigarettes. That's your excuse? That's no excuse. Accept Islam. And then work on stop smoking cigarettes. I just like girls. I just got to have some girls. I, I mean, I just, I got to have a girlfriend. Okay, we know it's a sin to have a girlfriend. Accept this lamb. Allah will forgive you of your sins. And we'll work on that. I, I, I just love gambling. I can't shake this. If, once I can get rid of this gambling, I'll become a Muslim. Accept this lamb. Allah will forgive you of your sins and we'll work on the gambling issue. Don't use these petty excuses and these vices as an excuse. It's better for you to come into Islam right now, foot dragging and half stepping, than to go out those doors right now, full stepping, get hit by a cookie truck, and die in the state of non Islam. It's better for you. It's better for you to accept Islam. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that those of you who are Muslim, we have the duty to spread this word. Continue to spread this word of Islam and don't let anything deter you from spreading this word of Islam. For those of you who are in Rutgers University, whatever college or high school you go to who are Muslim, whatever job you work on, don't be afraid of inviting people to Islam. Don't ever be afraid of talking about Allah and the beautiful benefits that He's going to give us in this life and in the next. 
For those of you who are non-Muslims, even though you may not have understood what I said, even though you may not agree what I said, at least, at least, consider Islam. Consider some of the things that I said. And at most, before you leave this room, you don't have to have some water sprinkled on your head to become a Muslim. You don't have to get this big pool of water and you be dunked into this pool of water. You don't have to turn the lights out, put a rope around or a handkerchief around your eyes and be initiated by being beat down. All you have to do is become a Muslim. You don't have to fill out a form to spend some cash, $500 to become a Muslim. In your, your, your yearly annual membership. All you have to do is to say these words. I bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship except the one and true living creator, Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad, not Elijah Muhammad, not Billy Muhammad down the street with the bow ties, that Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, 1400 years ago, is the finality of prophets and messengers. If you say this, we don't care what you did before you came into this room. You could have been on the planet 60 years, 70 years, 80 years. We don't care what sin you committed. You're going to be forgiven for every single thing that you did. And you know what you did. And you know what you've been doing. If you say these words, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. I bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. All your sins are forgiven. The tall ones, the short ones, the black ones, the white ones, the intentional ones, the unintentional ones, everything you've ever done in your life, you're forgiven for it. I don't care, bank robbery, homosexuality, whatever you did, your slate will be clean. Clean, and you will be just like the day you came out of your mother's womb. If you say those words, and you will join the brotherhood of one billion fastly growing people in the world called the Muslims. And lastly, you will receive salvation. You will see that which no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, and the heart of a human being could ever even, or the mind of a human being could ever even imagine. You will receive things that he has promised us in his Quran. So, I thank you once again for inviting me here. I pray that Allah, He opens your heart to Islam. He allows you to come into the fold of Islam. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make all of you who are Muslim strong in the effort of bringing people to Islam and to loosen the knot in your tongue and make the people understand you and make your task easy for you. And I pray that you who are non-Muslim, like myself who was a non-Muslim, come into the fold of Islam before the day that you have to stand in front of your Lord, the day which is a dreadful day, a day which we won't be able to make any more excuses. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين أجمعين في كل مكان. سبحانك ما محمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك. Anything that I have said that is correct is from Allah, and anything that I have said that is incorrect is from myself. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.